Hi, uh, we're going to continue with environmental chemistry and we're going to talk about now uh, some of the other topics. The first one we're going to talk about uh, next is acid deposition. Acid deposition refers to anything, any of the acids that are formed or released into the atmosphere then they can precipitate down onto uh, materials and to uh, organisms uh, into the sea and lakes, etc. Now, naturally, rain is uh, acidic because when uh, water reacts with carbon dioxide, it forms a carbonic acid, and so it gives uh, rain a natural, uh, sorry about that, a natural uh, pH of approximately uh, 5.65. Anywhere above that, uh, down to uh, 5.65, is considered natural. All right, acid deposition by, or acid precipitation by definition is uh, any uh, pre uh, precipitation that will have a pH lower than 5.6. That means that it's uh, relatively uh, acidic. All right, now uh, acid deposition is a secondary type of pollutant that is caused by the reaction of nitrogen and sulfur oxides with the moisture in the air with atmospheric water to form uh, nitric acid and sulfuric acid. As you can imagine, uh, both uh, those acids are quite corrosive and they have a significant effect on uh, the environment. Uh, wet deposition is just uh, a way of talking about the different types of deposition that you can have. Wet deposition are those that uh, are more common for us. We can think about it as uh, acid rain or acid snow. We may not talk much about acid snow, but that's definitely a problem. And here in the Bay Area, we have a large problem with acid fog. Any of these ones that are, are actually have a lot of moisture um, are called wet deposition. Dry deposition, instead, is the actual fact that you have uh, the gases flowing through uh, the environment, and those gases are acidic, or you can even have solid precipitation. If you go to the windowsill and you just touch like this and you see all of the powder that is formed, that is normally that has precipitated, that has come out and deposited basically from the gas form into the solid phase directly. Um, there are a couple of reactions that you need to know about how these secondary pollutants are formed. And these are the reactions of uh, sulfur reacting with oxygen to give you sulfur dioxide. That's the primary pollutant, and then the sulfur dioxide will react with water to give you sulfurous acid or, or sulfuric 4 acid, but in addition sulfur dioxide can react with water, oh, sorry, with oxygen to give you sulfur trioxide, which then reacts with water to give you sulfuric acid. Both of those acids, sulfuric acid or sulfuric 6 acid and sulfuric 4 acid or sulfurous acid, are highly corrosive, uh, in particular sulfuric acid being a strong acid. Similarly, um, and sorry, and the source of uh, SO2, of course, is when you burn uh, fossil fuels because they have that sulfur in it. Um, nitrogen monoxide, as we said earlier, it gets formed by the internal combust the high temperatures in the internal combustion engine, and so we're going to be able to break the nitrogen nitrogen triple bond and react it with oxygen to form a nitrogen monoxide, and that will react with uh, more oxygen to form nitrogen dioxide and eventually that nitrogen dioxide could react with water to form nitrous acid and a small amount of nitric acid. Similarly, the nitrogen dioxide can react with water uh, and more oxygen to form uh, large quantities of uh, acetic, uh, of nitric acid. And this formula here at the bottom, I'm going to highlight it as we're talking, this is an important one to know. Uh, so is this one, of course. Uh, those ones that form um, these key components are uh, very important to, to know. All right. The oxidation of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen monoxide into uh, their higher oxides, to the dioxide, the trioxides, uh, are going to be, uh, in many cases, uh, catalyzed by, by solid particulates that are floating in the air. So that's one of the other reasons why we are concerned of the uh, presence of particulates in the air because they cause or they can increase um, the effect of acid precipitation. Now, how or uh, what do acid deposition, uh, what does acid deposition do on um, substances? Well, if we look at the materials, uh, if you put acid on metals or on carbonates, 
you're going to uh, di uh, dissolve them, all right, in the presence of uh, uh, carbonates like uh, calcium carbonate, which is present in marble and limestone. If you put sulfuric acid, you're going to make uh, sodium, um, sorry, sorry, calcium sulfate, which is soluble, and so you're going to wash away some of the material. Um, this can also react the calcium carbonate directly with uh, the sulfur dioxide uh, to uh, be dissolved as well. And so you don't have to have the precipitation. You can also have acid gases flowing through. And this is one of the things that um, causes a lot of the wear down of, of buildings, the wear down of uh, external statues, uh, as you could actually um, envision if you see uh, the uh, the marbles that were left in uh, in uh, in Athens, how much they've been uh, corroded by the pollution and the acid uh, rain that happens in Athens. Uh, the next set of equations talks about what happens with carbon uh, calcium carbonate when it reacts with uh, nitric acid. Again, it makes the nitrate both the sulfate and the nitrate are soluble, so uh, you're going to have the wearing down and the erosion of uh, those materials. It will also cause uh, the solids to become, uh, the calcium carbonate to become more brittle and therefore it can start flaking off and that's also one of the big problems that we have uh, with buildings, uh, with sculptures. Again, uh, you can think about also the, the limestone that was used uh, for making the gargoyles in uh, cathedrals and all those kind of things. If you look at Paris or something like that, you can see also uh, the wearing down. On metals, uh, here I have a couple of examples. You can see that the acids with, will react with iron, for example, and which is one of the things that we have we use a lot in our bridge building, uh, and will cause will form uh, either iron nitrate or iron uh, sulfate, normally iron two, uh, which is the first set of oxidations that you will have, and that is strong enough, or that is a, a, um, a reaction uh, large enough that you're going to be basically eroding away the metal. It's going to start causing it to rust. It's going to cause it to um, dissolve. And of course, we don't want that. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the uh, bridges here in the country are in such poor shape. Um, also, very interestingly, you could also react um, materials like silica, um, uh, sorry, alumina, aluminum um, oxide, for example, uh, becomes solubilized. And aluminum ion, Al3, is a rather nasty and toxic um, ion for plants. And so this actually is a nice segue, segue to the next bit. Uh, if we lower the pH of, um, of the soil, um, well, we're going to wash away, we're going to leach out some of the important nutrients in the soil like calcium ion, potassium ion, and more importantly, magnesium ion, which is so important for uh, photosynthesis. We cannot produce uh, chlorophyll without magnesium ions. And therefore, if we don't have enough photosynthesis, we're going to have the plant be stunted. It will not uh, grow as uh, properly. In addition, because we solubilize aluminum uh, 3 plus ion, that is going to cause root damage, which is toxic for the plant, of course, and it also causes a uh, decrease in the root. So the anchoring of the trees or plants is going to be less, and so they can be blown over by uh, the wind. Finally, dry precipitation can cause uh, the clogging or uh, blocking of the stomata, which are the pores uh, in the leaf that actually allow for the exchange of gases, carbon dioxide and oxygen are exchanged in the leaves. And so if we block that, we block uh, the formation or we, we prevent uh, photosynthesis from taking place. Uh, if we also in, uh, increase the acidity or lower the pH of rivers and lakes, we are going to basically cause the death of many of the uh, creatures that live in there, and more uh, importantly, uh, of the fish. As you can see, below six, you don't have anything uh, of any of the important game fish that we actually consume. Uh, below five, there are no large fish of any sort. And any, anywhere below a pH of four, the um, lake is effectively dead, all right? In addition, higher concentrations of nitrates, which can act as uh, fertilizers, can cause uh, al algae blooms and what is called eutrophication in the case of, in which the algae and um, bacteria basically consume all of the oxygen and every other uh, organism there dies. 
Um, of course, uh, acid, if acid rain has effects on humans as well. Uh, it can cause irritation of uh, all of the mucosa, so basically our lungs, our nose, our eyes. Uh, it can cause a series of respiratory problems, including asthma and bronchitis. Uh, and if it's too grave, it can even cause emphysema. Um, and it will also increase uh, risk of metal poisoning because as we consume water um, that has more metals in it, some of the toxic metals such as lead 2, copper 2, and aluminum 3, uh, which is thought to perhaps be linked to Alzheimer's disease, are um, going to be uh, more soluble. And so definitely one of the reasons why we want to use uh, some type of filters to remove excess um, metals from our drinking water. So how do we control this? Well, it's straightforward. Uh, the first thing that we need to do is remove the sources of nitrogen and oxygen, uh, um, sorry, nitrogen and sulfur oxides, uh, which means we have to try to reduce any of the sources of air pollution that we described earlier. So we need to uh, move away from um, fossil fuels that contain so much uh, sulfur, all right? Uh, the nitrogen part is we have to start stop using the internal combustion uh, engine as much, and so basically moving into some uh, other types of engines that will have lower temperatures, uh, whether it's the hydrogen engines or uh, electrical um, type of engines for our cars would be much better. Um, overall, a, a, a decrease of fossil fuel uh, would be great. and. This is not a solution, but this is one of the ways in which we try to uh, minimize the effect of, um, of um, acid deposition is liming of lakes, but we also do that for the soil. We lime the soil and we lime lakes to increase the pH to make neutralize some of the acid, but this is uh, a band-aid. We cannot do this um, forever and we cannot do that with everything, so it is not uh, really a fix, but it's just a way of um, giving us a little bit more time while we can change uh, our sources of fuel. Um, I also want to spend some time talking about uh, today about uh, the greenhouse effect. Uh, and the greenhouse effect is really poorly uh, discussed by students, so I really want you to focus on those highlighted uh, portions of the description. So here's how it is. The sun produces a short wavelengths uh, radiation that actually is allowed to pass through the, um, uh, the atmospheric gases. Short wavelengths it means we're talking about ultraviolet, we're talking about violet and blue uh, light. All right, that energy comes through uh, and it's absorbed by the heat. It heats up the soil, the earth, and the earth will re-radiate back out into space. Uh, but it won't radiate the same wavelengths. It radiates at a longer wavelength. So notice the difference. First, the gases allow short wavelengths to pass. The Earth radiates back out longer wavelengths, i.e., uh, they try to they they radiate in the infrared, the IR radiation. They, this longer wavelength radiation is absorbed by the greenhouse gases uh, because of their natural frequencies in their bonds, and uh, the gases will re-radiate this out. Some of it goes out into space, but some of it gets radiated back towards Earth, where it gets trapped. All right, so you cannot say it just traps uh, radiation. It's, it's because it actually is radiated back, both in the direction of the space, but also back into Earth, which will keep some of the heat uh, in our system, increasing the temperature. All right, now... Uh, the most abundant uh, greenhouse, gas, uh, greenhouse gas is water, uh, but we don't tend to talk about that one because it is uh, natural. It's just present in our atmosphere um, in huge quantities. So we don't uh, consider it like that. But uh, there are other uh, gases that have stronger greenhouse effect or factors, all right, than wa water, and we normally compare them to that uh, greenhouse effect of uh, carbon dioxide. The most common ones are um, methane, carbon dioxide, uh, dinitrogen oxide, ozone, and CFC. CFCs, uh, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, uh, are actually very strong um, um, gases as well for, for greenhouse. 
Um, there is one more recently used, which is sulfur hexafluoride. All right. It is not a very small, it, there is not very much of it in the atmosphere, but because it has a very large uh, greenhouse factor, we also like to include it. Now, if you want to look at those uh, values, again, I gave you a sheet. Please look through those uh, and see what are the sources of those um, greenhouse gases. All right. Now, what is the problem with the greenhouse? The greenhouse gases, uh, a lot of times we used to talk about it as global warming, but the reality is uh, a little bit more uh, nuanced. It is going to cause a series of changes. It's going to cause uh, the oceans to expand um, because as the oceans heat up, they will also expand a small amount. Uh, it's going to cause the uh, melting of the polar caps and glaciers, and that is also going to ra raise uh, the levels of the oceans. Uh, because the temperature is going to be higher, we're going to have greater vapor pressure, which starts a cycle of increasing also the amount of uh, water vapor in the atmosphere, therefore trapping more heat. And there will be climate disruption. I think that's the uh, more current terminology that we tend to use uh, because we're going to change the areas where there, was, there are floods and droughts and uh, that's going to basically cause significant changes or uh, problems for agriculture. Areas that uh, where you could grow some crops no longer get enough water or they don't have the right temperatures and we're going to have uh, those areas become um, uh, infertile for that type of crops, but new areas perhaps in higher latitudes uh, may become available. Similarly, there's going to be a change in biodistribution. Uh, as the temperatures increase further towards the uh, north and the south, uh, we're going to have distribution of more of the tropical diseases and pests, uh, but also areas, again, that were not uh, open for agriculture may become open for agriculture, but the problem is that uh, the big uh, bread baskets of the world, uh, like uh, the Midwest uh, in here in the U.S., uh, may actually have significant effects. So let's look at this uh, image that I have put in here for the greenhouse effect, just to walk you through it one more time very quickly. Uh, the sun is going to radiate at, at short wavelengths, all right? And that's going to be able to pass through uh, the, gas, the greenhouse gases because they do not absorb at that frequency. Then that uh, energy is absorbed by the Earth and it's going to be re radiated in a lower um, wavelength, um, sorry, in a, in a longer wavelength, uh, lower frequency radiation. It's going to be re radiated in the form of uh, infrared. That uh, is going to be then absorbed by uh, the gases, which will radiate some of it out into space and radiate back some back onto the Earth. And that is what causes the uh, increase in temperature in our planet. Okay? So that's that for uh, the greenhouse gases.